Thinks all the time. Has nothing to think about except thoughts. So, he loses touch with reality. And lives in a world of illusions. By thoughts I mean specifically, chatter in the skull. Perpetual and compulsive repetition of words. Of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else is useful in moderation. A good servant but a bad master. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs, words, numbers, symbols and ideas with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, such as bank balances and contracts, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. It isn't spiritual, that's also an idea, a symbol. Reality is this.
else doesn't there seem to remain a problem about existence, about being alive. Now let's go into what is that problem. At the sort of nitty gritty level. Very basic in our thinking is that we, as it say, one must live. We need to survive, to go on. We need, therefore, money for food, for this, that and the other. We must go on. And we know that we're not going to get away with it for very long. That after a certain number of years, we're going to die. But the, the thing is going to end. The thing that we call I is going to be as it is in sleep. Deep sleep with no dreams. But that between now and that happening, there may be the most ghastly pains. Not only perhaps the pains of physical disease, or being wounded, or hurt, but the pains of worrying about our failure of responsibility to people who depend on us. And we suffer other people's suffering simply because we're sensitive to their imagination who participate in their sufferings and our adrenaline and our chemicals respond simply by imagination to the sufferings of other people. And what about that? And so we can look at these problems and say, now, quite obviously, all these problems cannot be solved in a physical way. That is to say, we do not expect in our lifetime that medical skill will make us exempt from death. We do not seriously expect that human beings will all learn to be nice to each other and will refrain from war and horrors of that kind, racial prejudice and so on. We don't seriously expect to find a method of being protected by taking some sort of drug against all possible disease and pain. And so therefore we say, now maybe there's another way around. Maybe that instead of solving these problems at the technical level, we can solve them at the psychological and spiritual by so disciplining ourselves, by so doing something for ourselves, that we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. So, in accord with that motivation, we seek out spiritual teachers, psychological teachers, this, that, and the other. Could we somehow be made over so that we don't
Thomas tells you. Tells you, for example, that he made a bunch of clay pigeons, and when this uh, Jew, it's kind of an anti-Jewish document, this Jew comes up and says, you're not supposed to be doing that on the Sabbath, so Jesus claps his hands and the pigeons all fly off. Clay pigeons fly off. Or when one of his uh, buddies, uh, uh, get, that he gets mad at one of his buddies, so he uh, strikes the kid dead, and then has to raise the kid up again. Uh, when one of his teeth when one of his teachers criticizes him, he says, what do you know, you bimbo, and strikes the teacher and blind or something, you know. Jesus has a little kid in the Gospel of Thomas, and the, the infancy Gospel of Thomas is kind of a little rat, but um, that's the way people imagine him as a child. So there's the infancy Gospel of Thomas, there's the Acts of Thomas, who's very interesting. Thomas comes across as very anti marriage anti-family. There's the hymn of the Pearl, or the hymn, and it's also called the Hymn of Jude Thomas the Apostle in the Country of the Indies. Same doctrine. And it calls it the Hymn of the Pearl. There's uh, the Book of Thomas, the Contender Writing to the Perfect. So all of these different texts sprang up in early Christianity, most of them in the second century. The second century was a time of a lot of Christian literature arising in different places that didn't make it into the Bible. Before the discovery, though, of the Nag Hammadi codices, you probably already know how to spell Nag Hammadi because you've seen it in your textbook. It's just the name of a village in modern Egypt. I don't remember how many I's and D's and M's and D's it has, but it's something like that. That's that right? Dylan, uh, who is our, one of our teachers, he's an expert on all this stuff, so he can correct me. Uh, Nag Hammadi is a village in Egypt, and in 